Hello and welcome. This is From Day One's webinar, Smart Ways to Manage a Newly Remote Work Team. And our host will be Steve Kep. He's a co-founder and chief content officer for From Day One. Welcome, Steve. Hi, I am Steve Kep, co-founder from From Day One, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar about managing a newly remote work team, as so many of us are. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for attending and, and participating in today's event, which will explore how to help your employees make the transition to remote work in ways that keep them engaged, productive, healthy, all at a time of stress and uncertainty. We'd also like to thank our sponsors today, Amplify and Lumaps. Amplify's data-driven employee engagement improvement solution helps executives and HR leaders to make better people decisions and improve business results especially during unprecedented times like these. Amplify helps leaders with managing a remote workforce, finding opportunities to maximize production with fewer resources, and having confidence in what actions to take and when. Lumaps is a social and collaborative enterprise communication platform designed to connect, inform, and engage employees, no matter where they're working. This innovative digital workplace equips organizations to break down silos, streamline internal communication, and provide a space for employees to belong and have a purpose. Fully integrated with your productivity suite, Lumaps simplifies access to all corporate content, business apps, and social features in one place. Before we launch our conversation, a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. You can watch uh, for a written account of the conversation next week on our website. At 3 p.m., we will have a Q&A session. Please start submitting your questions around three using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Lydia Dishman, who reports for Fast Company on workplace issues and other topics. Over to you, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, I think it's a little strange for all of us who are used to doing live events, but I certainly welcome the opportunity to connect with so many people who really need to hear this information from our expert panelists. As Steve said, I am Lydia Dishman. I am a reporter and editor with Fast Company, and I've covered a variety of workplace issues for the last many years. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm going to now ask our panelists to give us a brief introduction of themselves, their company, and also if they would tell us how many people in the organization have moved to working remotely during this time, and whether or not that is a brand new thing for them to do, or if they had a distributed workforce before. So Lydia Martinez, would you like to kick it off? Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lydia Martinez. I am the CHRO for the Long and Foster Companies. We're headquartered in the Washington DC area. And we have a footprint that spans 37 states around the US. So we've had a little bit of experience for a while with remote work for approximately 300 of our um, 2,100 employees. But for the last four weeks, all 2,100 pretty much are working remotely on a full-time basis. So a lot of learning during those past four weeks. Kate, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Kate Zimberg, I'm with F5 in Seattle, and we have about 6,000 employees uh, based around the globe in about 40 different countries. We have had a remote working uh, practice for over a year now, probably about almost two years now. So we've always had some level of remote working, uh, especially recently. Uh, and in the last four weeks, we are also 100% remote at home. So we, we have made the complete switch over at this stage. Willie, you go next to tell us. Uh, thanks, Lydia, and uh, from day one team and, and sponsors and all. Uh, Willie Jackson, consultant and facilitator with ReadySet. ReadySet is about 10 folks. Um, we've been remote friendly for a while. My role is actually to be out in the world. In a former life, I was a keynote speaker and uh, did a lot of things on site for and with a lot of our clients and at public events and whatnot. Um, so we've been remote friendly for a while and obviously we've transitioned to um, not convening uh, as a team, but our job is per, to support uh, organizations large and small, uh, especially in this dist distributed context. So it's familiar to us in some ways um, and of course brand new in the space that we're holding for a lot of our clients right now. 
And last but not least, Santiago, tell us about your experience. Hey everyone, I'm really happy to be here uh, with you all today. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Amplify, and we are a software and consulting company uh, that helps, uh, like we talked about, uh, help leaders make decisions about um, how to manage employee engagement. For us, we went fully remote about four weeks ago. Um, our previous experience with that, we had had about 10% of our team be remote, a couple of executives and a few sales reps, so some of the, and even the executives would fly in um, to headquarters pretty regularly. So we kind of had a hybrid approach and uh, we've gone full remote um, as of about a month ago. So it's all new basically for everyone all over the world, really. Uh, we are not alone here in America. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to start with was that, um, just to note, to put this in perspective, just before many of us across the country and all over the world were told to shelter in place, FlexJobs data indicated that only about 4.7 million Americans, that's basically about 3.4% of the population, was working remotely full time. So you know how many people we have just in the United States alone. That is a fraction of our workforce. So a lot to get used to. Needless to say, this was a huge transition for many employers and employees. And while a large amount of white collar work can be done with just a laptop and a Wi-Fi connection, there's a lot of nuance there when it comes to managing remote teams. And one of the biggest adjustments that I heard hinted about, but not really making any headlines, not terribly sexy, is the technology piece. So my question to you all is, did you do a Tech 101 with your staff to sort of go beyond what the guidelines were, what you actually needed to give them to do their jobs? Uh, and that can be anything from extra equipment to educating employees about what security and privacy look like when they are working remotely. So I open that up to all four, all three of you, four of you, sorry. And um, who's, who wants to take it first? Uh, I'm happy to jump in really quickly and I'll, I'll kind of go first because I've got my little ring light up here. I'm not sure if you can see my hands are on fire. So we did actually invest in our infrastructure here in particular because we switched from doing a lot of in-person trainings to remote fully distributed trainings, of course. So um, the visual uh, impact really matters. And so that's instructive to both the clients that we support and internally how we facilitate, how we think about the experience. So uh, we invested in microphones, uh, lighting, uh, additional lighting, uh, options for head, you know, headsets. So I have a, a backup headset here. I'll show you how the sausage is back. So I have, a, have a, a, a backup headset here in case the battery here dies. And I'm, I've got multiple backup devices here. So things like that. Uh, on the subject of Zoom, there's a really interesting conversation taking place globally uh, about the security implications. I'm not sure how many people have been, have been tracking that, but it's just really fascinating shortcuts made on the engineering side to make it really easy for people to adopt. Um, and it's come under some scrutiny recently as their stock tank, stock prices taking a nosedive around um, the security implications and some of the gaps there. So I'll, I'll pause there, but the short answer for me is yes, absolutely. It's been absolutely paramount as a facilitator and as a trainer uh, to think about how we come across digitally. I'll, I'll jump in next. As a technology company, we of course had a huge portion of our workforce was already uh, using laptops. So we didn't have to worry about that extremely, but we did have a portion of our population that didn't have those particularly those that work in our operation centers. And so we did very quickly make sure that all of those employees had uh, technology equipment, as well as those hourly workers who may not be able to work directly in office, but could be at home helping out with projects or taking advantage of learning opportunities uh, during this time. And then we do have uh, an ongoing ask out to our teams to say, do you need a work from home package? whether it's monitors, keyboards, camera, anything like that that would make your work at home experience go a little more smoothly for you. And so we've been putting that out to employees to allow them to get involved, involving lots of training. So we use Zoom heavily as well as a number of other products. And so definitely providing training, but then it crowdsourcing a lot of tips and practices. We use Microsoft uh, Teams, others would use Slack. And so using that very, very actively to crowdsource ideas for how to do things even better. And that's been really engaging for employees around the world. So um, it's interesting. Our experience has been 
very educational, I must say. We discovered that for the last two, if not three years, not only have we been providing access to technology, but we've also been giving the tools and the training and the resources. Um, the urgency of the virus has forced people to actually go back and find that information. So we were looking, for example, at our help desk numbers today and think about it. We moved from about 300 people working remotely to approximately 2,100 in four weeks. You would think that our week over week and year over year um, number of requests for our help desk would have triple or quadruple. They are the exact same number as they were a year ago, which leads us to believe that we have provided, the company had provided both the information, the training, what we were unable to provide, the virus provided for us, which was the sense of urgency. Now you have to do it. Now there are no other options. So people have picked up on it and actually found value in adoption. So all of that reluctance before where there were other options, pretty much gone by the wayside. So in those terms, it's a great experience. Now with the security, a lot of refreshing messages. Uh, remember the threat remains out there. Um, this is not your computer, it's still the organization's computer. Um, so reminders, but not too far away from the heightened awareness that we already had um, while working at the office then. Great points have been raised on the hardware and security. I think the only thing I'd, I would add to that is um, for us, it's been really helpful to confirm the sort of the rules of engagement, the best practices around it. So if for one, one of them would be if we're on a Zoom and it's at all possible for you to be on video, be on video, right? 80% of communication is nonverbal. And so whenever possible um, on Slack, for example, we've really clarified expectations. If it's something uh, that is not urgent but high priority, that's email. And we're, we expect folks to respond within 24 hours on Slack. Act, that's probably non-urgent and low priority and that is uh, or high priority and that's respond as soon as possible for text that's urgent and high priority and please respond as possible so just really clarifying to folks what communication tools um, to use for what topics and what are the expectations of communication since what you lose one of the main things that we have lost and, and others have lost with this is that sort of water cooler chat the ability to go and knock on somebody's office and so communication um, is required to be so much more intentional um, and I think clarifying the rules of engagement for the organization or at least suggested best practices um, has been a really powerful um, uh, tool for us and uh, that we're recommending to our, our customers and those who have those of our customers that have implemented those suggestions have seen you know the, the uh, communication engagement drivers rise in their employee engagement results so we've actually both validated that clarifying that actually um, meaningfully uh, impacts employee engagement when folks know what channel to use for what and what's the expectation um, of their response I just want to uh, jump on something that Santiago just said because such amazing points, especially uh, I want to play off of the, the video focus. I have a number of friends who work at other tech companies and, and other places, and I've heard from some of them that even though they've all, all made the switch to work from home, that they are not used to using video. And so many of them are still, they may be using a Zoom or a Skype or whatever it might be, but they're not turning on their cameras and they're feeling disconnected and they're not feeling that uh, sense of human connection that I think those of us that are actively using video as a normal course of work are feeling. And so if, you, if you're in a company that's not using video, that is one recommendation I definitely make. Get everyone on video, it makes a massive difference. Um, it's interesting that you both brought up this um, because I had definitely intended to ask these questions about how you were engaging people in these virtual forums. And I'm curious also, you mentioned that you're using Zoom and Slack and Teams. One of the things that I noticed and I've heard other companies doing is even if you're in a chat channel, the photographs can be a huge way to engage people. And I know that at Fast Company, we just had our baby photo day yesterday, which was so much fun. Uh, even just that 15 minutes of people sort of scrolling through and seeing, you know, who was responding and, and whose baby picture it was, was, I thought, a really great morale booster. So when you are using these tools, what is that little extra thing that you're doing 
to encourage that level of engagement, that level of personal engagement. For us, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to be really uh, intentional and planned about it. It's there, of course, is just ad hoc people are doing things, but I'll, I'll take our HR team in the Americas, for example. I've been leading a small project team where we are just uh, sourcing ideas for what we can do every day as some form of check-in, whether it's a business-related topic or every Thursday now and late in the day, we have Thirsty Thursday and it's always a theme. So today's our baby pictures. Uh, Wednesdays, we have lunch together over Zoom and we play a game. So yesterday we played April-related trivia. A uh, couple weeks ago, my team, my direct team, we had pajama day. So we all wore our pajamas all day Friday and showed them off on the camera. Work appropriate, of course. Uh, and so we just, you know, just planning it, engaging others in what they want to do, and really importantly, recognizing the whole person. So like, we're going to have bring your spouse to lunch day. We're going to have bring your kids to lunch day, bring your pets to lunch day. Yeah, you know, we're just going to mix it up so everyone has a chance to be who they are uh, and really intentionally so. Someone else want to take it? Oh, right. I'll jump in here. Oops. You're right. You want to go, Lydia? Uh, sure, why not? Uh, so for us, it's baby steps, I think, in terms of particularly the video, um, which I honestly believe it's probably the warmest element of all of this communication um, while we're working virtually. Not everybody, uh, we've discovered that not everybody's comfortable with it. So we're trying to be really purposeful about ensuring that there is communication, that everybody has the time, has some screen time. Um, particularly with my HR team, I have a really diverse group that um, allows me to gauge the response from my millennials and my, my boomers and everybody and see how, who's more comfortable than not. Um, but I think it's become a good equalizer, plus it ensures that the managers have a means of guaranteeing that connectivity, but it needs to be very purposeful. You need to be disciplined. You need to make sure that if you say you're going to do it, you actually stick to it and people can count on it. Um, but I love the idea. I'm not sure about the pajama thing. I need to, I need to digest that one a tad. Um, I don't know that I'm ready yet, not for mine, but for what I may see. So good. Um, I, I think I'll add two things. One is unstructured time. So one of the things that we do is we have office hours internally, just hang out, specifically not to talk about work. What's coming up for you? Are there any articles you've seen recently? In our Slack group, we have a water cooler channel. So things that are specifically not work related, since we've lost the connection, we've lost the ability to just walk by each other's desk. What are some ways of sharing things that we might have mentioned as we walk by somebody else's desk? The other thing I'll flag is how Lydia M and I jumped in and kind of talked on top of each other. Having a process for putting your hand up in a meeting and say, I want to speak next. That's something we started seeing immediately. Like, how do you jump in? People don't want to talk over each other. People don't want to cut each other off. And if you wait too long for somebody else to finish and the conversation moves on, that's, it's kind of awkward. Like, so what is your process? So in, well, I won't tell you what we do internally, but we have a keyword in the internal Slack that basically says, I'm raising my hand and I'm I'd like to speak next. That's really, that's really yeah, helpful. Really... Um, Santiago, I wanted to go back to you for a moment where, you know, you were talking about setting expectations for asynchronous communication. Um, and I did want to ask, how are you handling meetings? Sort of like what Willie's talking about, like, how do you make sure people are heard? But also, is there a more frequent schedule of meetings or do you find that you're doing less? How is that working for you? Sure, yeah, I can, can share what some of what we're seeing and, and, and the, kind of one more high level comment, this idea of bringing the whole person and, and having this these spaces for more of the personal side, you know, they, it can seem fluffy, but it's very real. Um, there are drivers of engagement that friendship and connection um, absolutely drive engagement. The research and the statistics show it. So this isn't, this isn't just a sort of a soft fluffy thing. It is very much related to the effectiveness of the team, uh, the trust between them, and thus the collaboration that can ensue once that trust um, is there. And, and, and we build trust by understanding the human element of each other, not just sort of the robotic sort of work side. Uh, for us, in terms of meetings, uh, we've been pretty, pretty structured with that. We've started now weekly all-team meetings. So every single Monday at 10 a.m., to sort of to be friendly to all time zones, we kick off with a half to 45 minutes 
uh, talking about highlights for the week, the priorities for the whole company, um, allowing different teams to give strategic updates, and then uh, having an open-ended Q&A session. So that's been really helpful to have that new cadence. And then I personally have started something that at first I was pretty uncomfortable with, but uh, in my, I just go in my backyard with a sweater on and we'll record a sort of a personal video from the CEO uh, and we'll talk about some of the things that I was really proud of that week that our team accomplished and then kind of share one thought for the week and you know last week's thought was uh, a lot of us are feeling emotions let's not repress them let's feel them and let's learn about ourselves through that which is more of a sort of a um, uh, less of a business update and more of a mindset um, and then we are encouraging every team not encouraging we're asking every single manager in our team to have daily one-on-ones uh, da excuse me daily stand-ups with their team, meaning just a really quick 15 minute, the whole team, what did you get done yesterday? What are you focused on today? And what blockers do you have today to accomplish your top priorities? And every team member sort of lightning round goes through and that creates visibility on who's working on what, uh, which is what actually helps collaboration. A lot of the times folks want to collaborate, they just don't know who to go to for what. Uh, and so everyone sort of saying, this is what I'm working on, creates these moments of um, opportunity where you say, oh, you're working on that. Uh, I want to talk to you about that later. And uh, these connections happen. A couple of small kind of hygiene tactical things that we found also really helpful with uh, Slack communication or Teams or whatever is to clarify what channels are for what objective. It's kind of like communication channel hygiene. This, you know, general thing is not for personal updates. Water cooler is where you sort of post pictures of whatever there. The cat channel is where you post pictures of cats or dogs or whatever. And just um, writing down in the channel, right, there's a little place where you can sort of set the objective of the channel so that people know kind of like, oh, is this the right channel for this? And they don't have that uh, hesitancy before they do it. And another, uh, probably the last thing I'll share is um, we are also asking folks to put their status on Slack. So if they're green, that means they're available for a conversation. If they have a little light bulb uh, uh, on, it means that they're heads down. They're online, but they're working on sort of heads down priority work. Uh, or if they're not online, sort of just so others know what the status is. It's kind of the equivalent of is my door office closed or not? It's sort of that, um, you know, similar idea. And then we've added a lot more programming for the whole person for us uh, and, and encouraged our clients and given them resources to do that. Some of the things that we did last week, I was so proud of the team, is we had five well-being chats each 30 minutes, and we invited the whole company. And they were about the whole person. We brought in a personal finance planner to say, how do you budget during a recession? We brought in a nurse to talk about how do you stay physically healthy and how can we get educated about what this really is? The third one was uh, media literacy, a communication professor that talked about how to sift through credible media sources and non-credible media sources. Um, a fourth one uh, was a therapist, a uh, clinician, right, who talked about mindset and, and how to deal with anxiety and stress and grief uh, during this period. And, um, and surrounding our team with that and equipping kind of our customers with playbooks for how to replicate that on their own has felt our team really feel cared for and supported as a whole person, not only the technical aspects of how to do their job, but, you know, how to be uh, effective and healthy humans uh, during this time period. Um, it, and it sounds like part of what you're putting forth, especially when you're doing those, those short videos, that there's something positive, there's something optimistic about that. So the kind of we're all in this together sense. And I'd like to ask the others, um, how are you seeing how tone is affecting the way that you communicate through all of these channels? What are you telling your direct reports, for example, Willie? What are you telling, you know, your your clients and colleagues? How, like, what what role does tone have in these communications? It's such a great question. I, I love to uh, amplify what Santiago just mentioned around the consistency of the leadership going out and saying, this is a conversation from where I'm sitting. People are really benefiting, and we, I'm not going to make this political, but we're seeing some examples, um, particularly at the, at the local leadership level, around how you can consistently message in a way that's transparent, that does not shy away from the facts, and that inspires confidence. Um, and, and I think what that allows people to do is instead of feeling like everything is in flux, um, that they have something to orient towards. I can expect this tomorrow, no matter what the content of the message is, I can expect it to be there, and I can look to my leadership for that. So I think that's something that leaders can step into. The other thing I'll quickly share is embracing the suck, embracing what's not perfect. Uh, you know, a lot of people have different feelings around, you know, generational orientation towards video, uh, feeling comfortable 
wanting things to be perfect. You know, what, what if it's not just right? But embracing those as growth opportunities. We're all outside of our comfort zones. We're all connected to people that are moving through this. And the reality is we're moving through this from a place of mourning. Our, life, our lives have been upended in ways that we can't quite put our fingers on and we're really settling into new, new ways of working. So really embracing these as opportunities to get tighter around our messaging, stay closer to people, really clarify the communication norms and let people know what you're expecting of them. I think those are some helpful things that we've seen folks responding really well to. I would say uh, everything in addition to what Santiago and Willie have already said, uh, it, it is that also empathy and expressing the empathy from the top. And that's the empathy for, as Willie so appropriately said it, the suck, as well as empathy for the good and the joy that we can find. I think uh, one of the things that I love, are, and it comes straight from our CEO, he delivered a great message to everyone last week, again, 6,000 people worldwide about the importance of human first, even with our customers and shared stories about uh, you know, a salesperson spending time on a customer call and the customer's child walking into the room and the customer trying to shoo them out and the, and the salesperson saying, no, 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 I wanna to talk to your kid. Like, let me get to know what are they doing? What are they, you know, and, and that, that human approach to that customer and the, their life. And then, you know, the CEO or other executives on our leadership team, uh, they'll be, in the middle of a meeting and you can see their dog come in behind them or their cat walk across their desk or their child say, hey, what's for lunch? Uh, and so they're experiencing it with us and hearing that and seeing that from our executives makes them so human and really displays empathy for all of us because we are all in this together as a global world and nothing shows that better to a company, its employees than the executives leading and not being embarrassed by those things themselves. That's another area which is really interesting, particularly um, on the real estate side of the world. We are, we are a company of handshakes. So culturally, this distancing, it, it's really, really disruptive to the industry as a whole. Um, so the initial reaction from all levels of the, of the organization is, if we can shake the hand, then this is just not gonna work. So it's been really interesting to watch trying to find that same warmth of that handshake through virtual communication and video helps. But there's, I think we're still on that stage where we're trying to transition the office into another office that feels the same at home. So that the level of informality really still hasn't kicked in. I think it, it will evolve into it. I think the level of comfort will come with it. And as it becomes a more normalized um, culture, I think we're, we're gonna grow. But I think the, the financial sector um, overall is likely to, to slowly move into, the, into normalcy in this virtual world, just because culturally the, and historically, it's been a very formal button up, handshake and sit down straight type of, of industry. So. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> you, know, you said the word safety, and it made me uh, think of, of something. Um, so uh, Project uh, Google's Project Oxygen, if you're familiar with it, was this data-driven um, research project that Google did about all their high-performing teams. And they found that the one thing that was most statistically common across the highest-performing teams was um, the presence of one condition in that team, and it was psychological safety. Psychological safety is the idea that I can be my full and best self, bring my, my sort of my real authentic self to work, um, give ideas that maybe my manager disagrees with and still be okay, not be sort of punished uh, or harmed in any way by that. And um, it is so important for us to create psychologically safe environments. And in my video, I had the temptation to overproduce it and to have the marketing team help me and script it out. Uh, and I needed just a little sort of uh, shot of courage in the arm for someone to say, just like, just be yourself, just like it's shaky in the backyard, a bird's going to fly behind you, like just be authentic. And that will inspire other people and create the space for other people to also be authentic in the organization. So I think we do have a responsibility as leaders to take some risks and model um, that behavior that we are that are, we are wanting to see uh, in our managers and in our executives. And that's been 
I think a, an important part of, of me actually sort of having that unproduced video with shakiness and I'm walking around and, uh, uh, and a duck uh, was really loud in the background, but it, it sort of worked out uh, that well. Yeah. Steve, I know you want to break in here for just a second and remind people of where we're at. Yes, I just want to um, welcome anyone joining this webinar midstream. We are from day one and we we're looking at smart ways to manage a remote work environment, smart and humane as you've, you've emphasized. Um, we will have, be sure to send us some Q&As with the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At the um, one hour point, we'll start answering them. Um, additionally, our sponsors are Amplify and Lumaps. And now back to you, Lydia. Thank you. Um, and so for those of you joining, we are getting some amazing intel from these four expert panelists and i would encourage you if you did miss the first part of this there will be a recording and i would totally encourage you to go back and listen to it because they have shared some amazing tips and tricks and personal stories um, so my next question is going to launch off of that idea of being authentic selves and what it takes to encourage people to be their authentic selves, especially when they're not sitting with you or sitting next to you or across the table from you in an office space. And I want to know if you or your managers in your organizations are taking the initiative to maybe reassess strengths and weaknesses of your staff to assist those who might need a little extra help thriving in a virtual environment or to take those who are totally comfortable in any environment and maybe create a sort of sense of leadership in them to bring other people up along with them. And I'll open this to all four of you. So whoever wants to take it first, raise your hand. Go ahead and grab it. Uh, I, I think I'm reflecting as well on uh, Lydia Martinez's earlier response, and I think she hit on something super important about what is the culture of your company and going to a place that's comfortable for your culture um, as an organization. And, and that may evolve as we go through this, but knowing that it will look different for every organization based on your workforce and, and your normal and your industry and your normal ways of operating. Uh, so for us at F5, we our culture is one of human first and it just kind of it has been for a long time. So for us, we have been encouraging our managers and all employees to continue to really think about each person and what each person is going through. And so as a manager and leader, one of the things that I do, just as an example, is uh, I have an employee on my team who is extremely extroverted, lives alone, and is really struggling with that right now. And so even just hitting him up over Teams this morning, like, hey, how you doing? You don't even have to respond. Just want you to know I'm thinking about you. Um, I have others who had some people pass away. And so doing that personal reach, like, hey, how are you doing today? Do you need to take some additional time off during this period? We've got you covered. Don't worry about it. Do what you need to do. Um, you know, and then frankly, personally, it's also been a lot about vulnerability. Um, I'll be honest, early days of all of the COVID stuff, I had a day where I couldn't do it. I was just, did not do it. And uh, texted my manager and said, I need to be offline the rest of the day. I need a mental health day to be good for my team. And she's like, absolutely. Uh, and I've shared that with my team and let them know what I did for my mental health day just to recover. And I was back the next day and, and I felt so much stronger. But for them to know that I was feeling it and that I did that went a long way to all of a sudden hearing directly from employees one-on-one, -on -one, this is what I'm going through. This is what's happening with my anxiety level. I am now finding a therapist to help me. Like, and just being vulnerable as a leader and bringing that forward to really bring that authentic self. And some people don't want to share. And so I don't pry. I've got some very private team members. They don't pry. You know, I'm available. That's what we stress, but it's up to them to bring it forward if they want to. So, Someone else? Lydia? So interestingly, um, as a sign of evolution, I will say, um, from our top leadership, we got this week, um, to his direct report, that um, message of consciousness of we've been going nonstop since all of this COVID started. And that's not the nature, it's not necessarily his nature or the nature of our executive team. 
but he took the time to say that he felt that we each should set aside one afternoon a week and just coordinate so that the rest of the team would know not to reach out and just clear the air. And it was interesting because his literal statement was, and please plan in not work, um, just because we all need that, that space for personal wellness. That I can tell you culturally, it's an insane big leap from a group particularly that feeds on the exact same stamina of work, 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 and to be able to realize that we need to take a step back or we're not gonna be our best, I think was huge. These are such great points mentioning. I think the one thing I would offer is that there's such a big difference between working from home and working while quarantined. Um, there's a very, very big difference in how it feels, uh, the pressures we're under, the space that we're holding, the things that are off camera, and even on this continuum of vulnerability and sharing things as leaders should and, and, and ought and, and are stepping into, there's still going to be things that we're not quite comfortable sharing just yet. You know, we're upgrading our, uh, our connectivity because everybody's online right now, and so the broadband pool is shrinking, and there are a lot of things like that that people are scheduling and managing and getting rescheduled, and then finding dates that are, you know, a month in the future. So I think there are a lot of non-obvious areas that are um, really affecting people deep, di differently. And I guess I just loved actually naming those uh, in particular, naming the things that you're doing, how you're moving through them, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the one nugget I'll, I'll offer is working from home and, and working while quarantined means in practice we work more and get less done. And I think this maps to some of the expectations we need to set as leaders and people managers. I know we're going to speak to some of that in a little bit, but I, I would drop that as well. Yeah, I just want to um, speak a little bit to that, Willie. Um, I don't think we've gone out with a company-wide message on this, you know, at this point. But it's interesting, even talking within our HR organization, we're actually finding that we we have pretty high productivity during this time. Which, on the one hand, you'd be like, "Oh, that's great." On the downside, we are worried that people are not separating their work life from their home life, and we are trying to. A, a number of us as managers and leaders are trying to caution people of, well. Yeah, it's great if your productivity doesn't slip, but don't go through heroics to make that happen. Like you still have to separate out your work from your home. And I know I, I can, I encourage all of my people, make sure your Saturday and Sunday look different than your Monday through Friday, because I don't want you working seven days a week. And same thing, you know, with your evenings or whatever your time schedule has to be, you know, with family and everything else. But Willie, you're right. Like there's, there can be a productivity hit. There can also be a productivity bump, but at what cost? And so always being thoughtful about that. For us, one of the things that we've done is really lean into purpose and meaning, right? McKinsey talks about that the next evolution of leadership is sort of it went from the scientific management being IQ, sort of organizing people into predictable outputs. Um, the next phase was EQ, like caring about the emotional quotient. And then now the leadership frontier is MQ, the meaning quotient, our ability as leaders to tie what someone does on a daily basis to how um, it does something good for the world or other people. And so we posed this question for our team, which led to some interesting unintended effects. We asked them, how could we live at our purpose uh, at Amplify of unlocking the potential uh, of people at work? And uh, all of a sudden the product team is like, if you're really asking, uh, we should pause what we're doing on our core product and create an immediate free tool to give away to the market to help them understand how their team is doing with COVID. And so we literally wiped our roadmap for a week and a half and that team got so motivated that without us asking them, started working days, nights, and weekends to sprint um, to about two weeks ago, we released this free well-being tool. It's not a plug for Amplify at all. It's completely free, no strings attached. Um, and within five minutes, a manager can send a quick assessment with like 15 questions to their team to understand how they're doing mentally and psychologically with COVID, how they're equipped with remote readiness, um, and the, the, any blockers to productivity from home. And so I, I had a huge leadership failure about four years ago where I just didn't sense my team members struggling and a couple of like co-founder and a couple of executives left and they were like, it's because of you. And I was like, oh my gosh, like how did these things sneak up on me? I realized that I had these blind spots of understanding what each individual needed the most. Um, and I'm more of like a head sort of analytical guy. So that, that sort of empathy and that connection to how they were doing was harder for me. So I literally started Amplify just to be like, how can we equip leaders with data to know on a personalized way, what does this person versus this team does? Because they need totally different things. I've noticed that there are some head first leaders 
uh, that don't as much lead with the heart. And those I'm coaching like, hey, be human, like lead with the heart, show some emotion, some vulnerability. And the other ones that are more lead with the heart, it's like, hey, take a step back, strategize, think about your priorities. Don't just follow instincts and emotions, but sort of think through what you need. And, and the, with the advice that a head first and sort of heart first leader are completely different. And so what we've done is um, internally and for our customers is how do we equip each leader and each manager with data so that they can take a very personalized approach. And so I know the employee engagement of each of my executives and I realize that each of them need a different thing to grow as leaders. And I'm able to create a personalized leadership roadmap for them specifically based on who they are, how their team is feeling about their leadership and their unique sort of personality bias uh, of how kind of they lean. Um, and that, that, that was in, but then the unintended effect was we started, uh, we started to see that the drivers um, of, um, of uh, rest uh, and, and competency and capacity started uh, going down for our product and engineering team. So we said, hey, you're about to burn out. When those sort of drivers go together, that predicts burnout. So we had to tell that team, hey, we know you're excited because we're like saving the world because we're equipping like thousands of managers to know how to best support their team, but like slow down. Like this is not a sprint, this is a marathon, like take some rest. And so it's been an interesting sort of interplay between Clarifying purpose and meaning has, has just activated folks in ways that we've n I've never seen the product and engineering work at that velocity and at that pace, yet at the same time, uh, using data to say, okay, when, are, when are folks pushing a little bit too hard and how do we adjust that pace to make it um, sustainable, for, even if we're doing really good and folks um, feel great about anything that um, they can do to help just a little bit with sort of the impact of this crisis that's going on. It's interesting that you're giving very specific ways to measure this level of engagement and perhaps head off burnout. I want to explore this idea of making allowances versus helping people set priorities a little bit more and ask the rest of you, how much are you leaving that up to the individual managers? Are you seeing people take initiative? to do that or is there sort of a company-wide culture-wide way to say i'm going to show you that these are the things that we need to accomplish in this time i also really need to tell you that you may be burning out if you push 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 as you were saying so just curious to hear how how the others are are handling this or seeing it being handled initially and i think we'll have to learn how to graduate um the levels i think they need we're in that transition into will of of getting that trust in terms of performance for people will the employees will the staff be doing what we think they're doing um because there's still a lot of the old thinking of if you're not in the office you're not performing at your best. And I think the experience has been incredibly positive, which leads me to believe that at some point we're going to have to provide more formal guidance on the when to stop, how to self-assess. I don't know, we're so diverse geographically um, that I don't know that we would be able to have a massive singular message, but I think that we can start detecting and providing clues to our to our teams on little signs to be on the lookout for, because they may be a sign that, yes, you're performing fantastically, but the price it may be getting a little bit too steep and you need to slow down. And that's not the expectation. I think it's going to be really, really important that the messaging that comes from the organization is consistent with that expectation that you will self-pace yourself. Yeah, Lydia, I'm reflecting on your question a little bit. And if I think about it, we, we definitely have had a specific conversation from our CEO and CHRO at a recent all manager call about the importance of pausing and reassessing priorities and having that conversation with your employees. Uh, have we mandated anything? Have we shifted at the corporate level? Not really. But I do know it's happening as you get down um, into the organization with a number of managers and leaders. Uh, so you're just kind of reflecting on, on the two sides of what you asked. Yeah, big plus one to reassessing priorities. Um, 
busy work has a really, really detrimental impact right now. Uh, it amplifies this feeling of isolation. It amplifies this feeling that we're not mission driven and not aligned and not responsive to what's going on in the broader world. So I think this is a really powerful invitation to that reassessing. Uh, internally at Ready Set, we've definitely paused some things that aren't, just aren't relevant to the current context uh, and really acknowledging the economic impact for a lot of companies. There are a lot of business models that are really under threat right now and folks need to take uh, some very drastic actions to ensure their viability over the next you know how, however long so uh, i think some of santiago's points around rallying around the mission clear communication about what you're working towards or the way that this filters down to teams expectations one-on-ones and our day-to-day schedule i think it's absolutely vital because it's an opportunity to rally people around a common purpose and really an opportunity for new leaders to emerge so in this distributed context introverts and extroverts are playing a different dance people can step forward and step back in different ways and as we flatten our hierarchies, there are opportunities for new voices and new leaders to emerge. I, I love, love that the new voices and new. Uh, I'm sorry, Kate. Go ahead. Go ahead, Santiago. Um, I, I love the new ideas and the new voices. And you know, for us, it, you know, the, it, it can be a temptation to sort of paint um, one way of leadership from a priority perspective versus sort of the extreme. And what I've found and what we've seen in, in the research is that it's actually a combination of both. The idea of Zappos holacracy, where everybody just comes up with their own priorities and self-organizes without sort of any type of, um, of priority and, and leadership, uh, to me is, is uh, this sort of uh, ideal sort of world that, that maybe doesn't quite exist with the messiness of humans, yet this obviously this command and control kind of old school mentality where priorities are cascaded and work is micromanaged is, is clearly coming to an end and not working for others. So the, the, for, for us, it's leading with what Willie talked about, right? Uh, getting ideas from, from all places in the organization to say, where are we going as a company and what are the outcomes that we need to achieve? And then stopping there and then asking the teams to say, what are the best, outco- what are the best ways to achieve these outcomes? So you both give direction, meaning this is the end goal. This is what success looks like, but there's ample flexibility for teams to come up with, well, what's the best way to get there? Um, And we found that uh, an owned solution is better than an optimal solution. Meaning if the teams can choose how they get to that outcome, they will own that. And that you, we as managers may not think that that's necessarily a very best sort of optimal way to do it but it doesn't matter like an 80% good enough sort of strategy that's actually owned by the person because they had a role in coming up with and creating it uh, will create nine times out of 10, uh, a better outcome at the end of the day. So that's the way that we, we try to balance and coach our clients and balancing sort of the, the top down sort of direction plus the uh, ideation ownership um, that uh, letting folks uh, have some autonomy. And actually autonomy is also one of the engagement drivers. And so it is really important for folks to be able to make some meaningful decisions about how they do their job with leadership, um, understanding perhaps how success is eventually measured. I, I love that you're all talking about trust so much because I think that this is really integral to this virtual environment, uh, to having distributed teams. Um, and Kate, I'm gonna let you talk in a second, but I did, um, I did wanna ask if you had one lesson that you've learned, even in this short space of time, about what it takes to build that trust, especially when you have some people who are naturally distrustful of a remote environment, like, I can't put my eyes on you, so I don't know if you're working. What has that lesson been? So, Kate, I'll give that to you. Mm, it's such a great question. There's probably many. Uh, but I will say one of the things, and this actually relates to what Willie and Santiago were just talking about, but it, it's something that I think we all know as leaders, but it's been reinforced for me, is the importance of clarity of ownership coupled with opportunity to participate. And so we found, and and I'll speak specifically within the context of HR, you know, when COVID happened and just everyone's scrambling and what do we take care of with our people? And all of a sudden there's requests coming out and ideas coming out and they're going to many people at once. You know, it could be five people on an email string of, hey, we should do this. And that's great, but now you've got five people all scurrying to do whatever that thing is. So I've been super intentional. I've asked others to be as well about saying, I need someone on that string to either grab ownership 
and others can participate or to say, you know what, it's actually this other person who's already doing the work. They own it, but we'll all jump in and see how we can help them. And I've heard feedback from the teams that especially in this time of chaos, uh, that having that sense of who owns what, that level of clarity, while still having encouragement to engage has been invaluable. And it helps them know what they can control and what they can't control in their work life. And I would say that's my other learning is to really encourage everyone to be thoughtful as they work with other people about giving other people choices, giving them clarity of ownership because there's so much we can't control right now. So what can we allow people to control? And that's that empowerment autonomy point that Santiago was making. But, you know, as much as we can give people that, we give them confidence, we give them purpose, and we, we respect them and what they bring to the table. That comes with trust, which is your question, Lydia, but um, I have a hard time answering that one. I don't know what that one is. Hopefully my peers here have some good ideas. But for me, it's really finding places to give control and giving it. Someone else want to take it? So, so um, I'll kind of take a slightly different angle to it. You talked about sort of how to build trust. And the, the thing I want to speak on is how to restore trust. Um, because, you know, trust is uh, eroded by the bucket full and sort of built by the thimble full, if you will, whatever a thimble is. Uh, it's much smaller than a bucket, though, apparently. And um, it, so for me, I, I found that it's nearly impossible to move a thousand miles an hour with other people and not accidentally collide into each other and, and have uh, moments and interactions that erode trust that we had good trust and, and now mm, I, I don't know that. For us, it's been really imperative to invest in our team with productive conflict skills. What happens when trust is eroded and that trust is not restored and that issue is not addressed is resentment happens. And that becomes, starts to become a wedge, just like sort of in a marriage, in a team, in a relationship, it's the same thing of being able to communicate and address problems together and it's been really important for us to provide uh, a productive conflict template of what does it look like um, to have productive conflict because the absence of conflict isn't good. Uh, let's, have, let's pretend that it doesn't exist and just like, no, it, it doesn't. And but there's also, it can be very unproductive conflict, which is probably why some of us shy away from conflict because we've tried it and it's gone terribly. And we're like, let's not do that again. And it's not, let's not do that again. It's just like, let's just find a better way to do that more effectively. Um, and so for us, it's just kind of like three or four step thing, super simple, is um, here is my perception of what happened. Um, here is what I imagine your intent was. Um, and then here is a request that I have for you of something different in the future. Um, and sort of having folks go through those steps with each other with kind of low heat issues. Because uh, if, if you have a big issue, uh, it, that's going to be hard, right, without facilitation to really restore that trust. But if we can get practice with, with little things, being able to um, restore trust and have productive conflict, then when we have a medium thing, we're prepared for it. And then when we have sort of a heavy, big, high temperature kind of issue, then we're equipped to be able to know how to solve it. So I think just as important as building trust um, is having an organizational capability of how to restore trust when it inev inevitably um, is eroded in the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, of our interactions. I think our, our experience so far has been, and, and I like your experience, your example of when um, everybody runs at it and you end up clashing on each of the four corners. I think the but having to be purposeful about how you communicate while you're um, in distributed teams creates two levels of clarity that you don't have when everybody's just like walking around the hallways and stopping in each other's office. And it's that we all agree as a team on what we're gonna do towards a project and everybody takes their piece and runs. And then we come back to check. And I think that purposeful check-in avoids a lot of the of the bumping into each other and working on duplicating efforts going towards the same thing. Plus it creates, it's created at least in my team, and I think most of the team is enjoying that, a sense of clear accountability of knowing that everybody expects you to take your part and bring it in and I'll bring my part. Well, I think when there's that lack of, of um, specificity in terms of, of the, the work allocation, if you're particularly, if you're a little bit of a micromanager, the tendency is, well, I know I'm not what I'm doing my part, but is he doing it? And I should go check. This forces 
um, a little bit of that trust and having the regular check-ins allows for that peace of mind so it doesn't create a big sense of frustration. I think it's also built that internal credibility within the team um, that can carry over. I imagine that the future of it will be a little bit less need for that regular intense contact where we're more comfortable with the understanding is that every portion of a responsibility I take comes with a piece of accountability and it's the expectation that I will deliver. Um, and I think teams will grow faster at a more certain pace than when we're all trying to do our job, but also do a little bit of the work of someone else that we're not sure will get it done like we would. I love the uh, I love these tips. I love specifically the focus on repairing uh, repairing trust. Um, so I've had the pleasure of doing an al our ally skills training at many of the from day one conferences. And one of the specific areas of focus here is how to repair harm. We can guarantee you that you're not going to be perfect every day. So the question is, how do you bring your values to bear in the recovery piece? What does that look like? So these points uh, Santiago is outlining around uh, building that muscle, practicing nonviolent communication, those sorts of things are absolutely vital. Uh, the second point I would make is around what is your working style and how have you clarified that with people? One of the reasons that people look for this command and control micromanage um, way of orienting when we're distributed is because they feel a loss of control. And so if when you're nervous, you reach for more con control and you're looking to meddle in people's affairs and double check on things because you feel nervous, that's an important thing for you to communicate. So at Ready Set, when we start a coaching engagement, for example, we'll start, we'll start with the psychometric. What is the way that you orient towards uncertainty? What is the way that you orient towards uh, a lack of clarity? If you reach for control and you're looking to double down on that when you feel stressed, that's a really good thing to communicate to your team, your direct reports, and your other leaders. Uh, if you are implicitly trustful and you trust that people are gonna do their work and come back to you as needed, and you're a hands-off manager, that's a really important thing to clarify as well. So there are all sorts of a set. There's disc assessments. There are quizzes that you can take online. You can just have a conversation about what feels good and what doesn't feel so good, but really clarifying how you work and your working styles. We have a, a prospective client that at the outset of every team project, they have a meeting specifically about working styles. And each one of them has found it so useful that they kick off every project and every work stream with, this is how I work. This is how I like to be communicated with, et cetera. The final thing that I'll mention is with the proliferation of these digital tools, uh, Zoom, Slack, Teams, Hangouts, etc. we are more distractible than ever. And so it's really tempting to get a quick answer with things over Slack, over text, etc. So I think as, as folks have mentioned, real clarity around what tool is for what kind of message is absolutely vital. Because we can essentially, as managers in particular, spend our days interrupting people and preventing them from doing the work that we're asking them to do. Amazing. Um, I just want to ask one more question of my own before we turn it over and take some questions from the floor and they are coming in thick and fast. So I'm pleased to see that a lot of people engaging. We are talking about building trust and engagement and and fostering this sense of inclusion. Willie, I think, you know, when you and I talked initially it became very clear that inclusion initiatives are more important than ever now that we're all distributed. But one of the things that is kind of not really getting talked about yet, and I think it's because we haven't reached that point, we're still in the period of chaos, is what happens to professional development? What happens to coaching? What happens to mentoring? Is there a thought perhaps that you know in a few weeks we're going to be moving towards doing more of that or are you leaving it up to individuals to kind of find their own way and find their own virtual mentors uh, i think it's now i think it's more important now than ever speaking from from where i sit um i think what we're, we're seeing is a range of things uh organizations and companies that have a mature way of going about mentorship a formal way of sponsoring people those organizations are starting to thrive in this context because they have those supports to fall back on for some organizations that we support that don't actually have manager training these people are really really struggling these teams and organizations are really struggling so the gaps that you have in your management and in your leadership are going to be 
exacerbated in this distributed context, and they're going to be exacerbated in times of upheaval and times of change. So uh, I think now is a really great time to pay attention to employee engagement surveys, uh, to double down on some of these tools that Santiago is making available for free around checking in with your team. What do you need? I think these things are absolutely vital and to communicate a bit more than you would tend to. That doesn't mean an hour long meeting every day, but these little pulse checks, how are you doing? Are you blocked in any way? What can I support you around? Where are you in all of this? Regularly asking because it's not always going to be comfortable saying uh, what you really need on the first or second time. But as that conversation becomes normalized, people who wouldn't normally step forward feel more confident and more capable to do that. So I think it's never too late to start uh, down that path. And it's more important than ever from where I'm sitting. Yeah, and for us from a development perspective, it's, it's interesting. I think I was reflecting this morning on mentorship because we do have a mentorship program. And so often we say, you know, it's really up to the mentees to drive that conversation and to reach out for what they need. And I would stress to any mentor right now, reach out to your mentees, check in on them because they're probably thinking right now, oh, they're so busy with their family. They're so busy with their own thing. More important than ever as a good mentor to just reach out, check in. Hey, do you need anything? You want to sync up? Do you want to, you know, whatever it might be. So that would be my one encouragement to all of us. From an F5 perspective on a leadership or on a development uh, point of view, we about a year ago released some leadership principles to the company. And we've been driving um, in a very focused way for the last year on getting those out, getting all of our executives trained, getting all of our managers trained. And our, our L&D team has a lot of new stuff they want to get out. Um, but what we've said, and this goes back to our priority conversation earlier, is we said nothing new right now unless it's coaching, because that is one thing we're looking at to make more available and commoditized for people. But instead, in support of employees around COVID and our response to COVID, let's make sure we weave those principles in everywhere. Because our response as managers and leaders and employees is to respond in a way that's reflective of those principles. And so just to really kind of uh, be tight and use it as a weaving opportunity versus an introduced new opportunity. Uh, I think my, my one point is here is if trust and engagement uh, is, is in professional development is so important, I um, 100% agree with Willie uh, and Kate that it's important now more than ever. But I think uh, taking a sniper laser like approach versus a shotgun approach. Um, excuse my violent metaphor, um, is, is important. We have more going on than ever. So sort of creating one big template of how everybody does it versus understanding what does each manager and each leader have. And so how do we do that at scale versus uh, not having to have conversations is if trust is so important, let's measure it. Uh, right? We all measure cash all the time as CEOs and as executive teams. We measure customer NPS. We measure all these things. But the, the thing that matters most at the end of the day, right, is our people, our culture, and the employee engagement of those people. Um, and so getting real data around that, uh, you know, whether it's Amplify or somebody else, it's lost the point. It's being data driven in how we approach um, these issues. I think can give us more confidence and clarity than trying to guess with such important decisions um, that um, that uh, relate to these things like trust, employee engagement, leadership, and, and manager, manager development. For us, this is actually, and we've been talking about this most recently, um, this is going to be a great opportunity to see from our old concepts about leadership, um, seeing what we are going to become in the next few years after this experience, what kind of um, leadership qualifications are we going to be looking for that we weren't looking for before in terms of who's thrive and who becomes more inspirational as we adopt this fast-paced change. So there's a lot of, of observation and a lot of willingness um, from all of the leadership to see who steps up to the plate and who takes a leadership position who may not have been there before, just because these different environments allows for a different way of, of leading. I'm going to turn it back over to Steve momentarily, who then is going to intro Santiago for a few minutes before we get into our live Q&A. Yes, this has been uh, really insightful and candid. And now in our last chapter, we'll be responding to your questions. You've sent in a bunch of good ones and you can send in more with the Q&A button. Uh, but before we start, um, uh, our panelist Santiago has to uh, sign off about partway through the Q&A. So we wanted to give him a moment to uh, tell us a bit about his company. Santiago, over to you. Sure. 
Uh, thank you, Stephen. I'll do it in one minute uh, so that we can get to the good stuff on the, on the Q&A side. So um, at Amplify, you know, we, we observed that there is uh, no shortage of employee engagement survey companies out there. But we started talking to folks using it, and everybody hates the employee engagement survey. It's like The CEO is like, why do I get data once a year when I look at cash and on a daily, weekly basis? Uh, and then HR is like this huge mountain of work once a year, once every two years. And then it takes a couple months to get the data back. Um, and then once you get the data back, Back. It takes a month or two to come up with the action plan. And once you come up with the action plan, it takes a month or two to communicate it and cascade it down the chain. And so it's like month six, seven, or eight. And like action, the 100 point action list, because you know we do it once a year, so we got to sign up for a lot of stuff to do, is like this long. And uh, managers are like, this happened six months ago. Like half my team isn't even here anymore. Uh, and, and so, and employees are like, nothing happened from this. And so, and then HR is getting ready to plan the next one. And the, everyone's just kind of like, why do we kind of repeat this insanity year after year? So we created Amplify to have actionable insights. And we figured out that it wasn't just the software and the data and the survey that was necessary to have confidence and clarity for leaders to know how to, what to do to improve employee engagement. What was necessary was kind of like Peloton. Peloton has the hardware, you know, the bike itself. It has the human elements, that screen that you stream a human. So we provide expert human coaching on the data to know what to do and a proven methodology, right? Like you don't have to worry when you jump on a Peloton whether or not you should go up and down how fast you should go. You just listen to the instructor and, you know, and ride. And so that's what we provide our clients is a very actionable, practical, and actually effective employee engagement survey experience that doesn't suck and that actually leads to action. And we do it more frequently than annual. And so especially in these times of uncertainty where the pace of business and the agility and adaptability that we have to have to protect and build our cultures is even more important. We provide customers with actionable data, expert consulting and coaching around that, and a proven methodology for how they not only measure, but also improve employee engagement. We are specifically helping our customers focus now on the psychological and emotional effects of COVID on their workforce, how to train managers to be effective managing remote, uh, and how to surround their teams uh, with the tools and support they need with precision level clarity. Not the same thing for every team, but a very um, a specific and personalized intervention for each team so that every manager in the organization has data-driven clarity about what's the one thing that my team needs most from me to be uh, more successful as workers and to thrive as humans during this environment. So that's what we do at Amplify. Um, if you'd like sort of our core product, that's what it does. We also have this free tool. You can find it at amplify.com forward slash well-being. And it's totally free, five minutes, and a manager can find out what their team needs more and most with this COVID environment in less than five minutes. Um, so that's what we do. So awesome uh, to have the opportunity to share uh, this time with all you panelists and all the attendees. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them because we are running out of time, but we'll try to do this as expediently as possible. And what I would ask, uh, instead of having all of you answer each question, maybe just one person can take each question. So I have one here from uh, Rika Solomon. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name here, but how do you address these personal life sharing requests for people who are more private? For example, those employees who are not openly out with a request to invite their spouse or partner for a lunch, and that could be a big risk. It's a very good question. Does somebody want to jump in and take Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, since I mentioned that as an idea, I, I think engaging in those activities you have to know your team before you offer up something that is that personal if you know that that is going to create issues for parts of your team and that's about being in tune with your team as a manager and leader then don't do it find something that is less controversial to do but also make sure that people have an out uh, so that they don't feel like they have to engage um, i'll share i told my team um, when we, they said they wanted to do this i said that's great just so you know my husband who i know you all think is make-believe because you've never seen him won't be joining here. He told me he has a meeting, whatever day it is that we're doing this. Uh, you know, and so again, letting them know that like, even my husband's not joining. So, you know, your spouse doesn't have to either, but know your team before you do it. And, uh, and then just make sure people have an out that that feels normal. Um, another question is what is your advice for employees who were on track to develop into a new role before the environment shifted? Are your companies focused on development of internal talent or hiring external talent right now? Or are they just more focused on surviving the current environment? 
I know we talked a little bit about leadership development and mentorship, but this is very specific. So new employees or employees on track to develop into a new role. So we've had a couple of those where, and it's interesting because they, at least the two that I'm thinking about, took different paths. Um, their, the leadership just put in front of them a little bit of the clarity on the uncertainty of what's coming and how even though they were scheduled to move into a role that was very well defined, that same role may not be as exactly defined as it was before. And just to assess their willingness to, to, to keep moving in that direction or um, delay the decision for a little bit. One of them prefer, interestingly, at least to me, um, to delay, to wait until the water settled a little bit more and uh, that particular company decided which path to follow. The other one said that he was willing and ready and if it changed, it changed and that was fine with him. So he's moving into the new role with that understanding that the role may not look in a couple of months like it originally did. Thank you for answering that, Lydia. Another attendee is asking, what advice do you have for training new employees that just started at your companies when this began who are not fully integrated in the company culture? Uh, and I had had a similar question myself, which is, how do you onboard? Because some people did hire before all this happened. We have a few of those um, because the world was not put on hold to give room for, um, for COVID-19. So the world was moving. Um, we have, we onboard um, most of the, the onboarding process, all the mechanics are actually online. So that has been, um, that can go ahead without much of a glitch. The issue had really um, resided on whether the, the hiring manager has the capability and it's adequately prepared to train remotely. And we've had some that have, and some that have a portion of the work for which they can train uh, remotely, but with the understanding that the hours could be reduced um, if the work flow becomes interrupted for too long a period of time. We have another one that we didn't quite address in this particular way, but uh, Janice Erickson is asking, how do you keep the team engaged when every member is in a different time zone? So we talked a little bit about asynchronous communication, but if someone has any other ideas about having people in different time zones coming together, have at it. I love this question. Uh, one simple tool is using a doodle poll, or you can vote internally on what time zones work. Um, what goes along with that, I think, is being present to what time zones typically went out. And if you have a, a smaller number of people in time zones that are, that are inconvenient for the dominant group or, or the majority of folks, then you should ask the, the, the folks to take one for the team at some point and make it come uh, uh, make the time that you select more um, convenient for the other folks. So ensure that there's that equity and inclusion around scheduling, but uh, I think having a shifting target and opportunities for different folks to be convenience and inconvenience if you're doing this over a medium time horizon um, is one way of tackling that. Another question that we kind of addressed, but maybe not as explicitly enough as this attendee would like, how do your companies address employee burnout remotely? And we did talk about the flip side of productivity is burnout. So if anyone has a very specific suggestion, please enter it now. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that because we've been doing a lot to help our employees with um, burnout, but also more importantly, just more broadly, I should say, um, mental health. So we have definitely been talking more about our employee assistance program than ever before, making sure that we have that available. We are also looking at getting licenses for all of our employees for meditation software so that every employee has access to that and can, and can engage with that. A lot of teams are holding med team meditation sessions as well. So uh, just trying to put a lot in place. We also do have um, an employee resource group that is focused around mental health and they've just started and they're becoming more and more active and we'll be planning some, some sessions as well.
last comments from me on that one. We're uh, we're having a lot of conversations around resiliency, right? Resilience is emotional elasticity, right? An individual's ability to take in challenge and difficulty and metabolize, alchemize that into personal growth and transformation by reframing that difficulty and that challenge. And so while certainly an unsustainable work situation that causes burnout isn't just addressed by just that more resilience, like that, you know, there's the, the sort of foundational um, elements that are uh, wrong with the role or with the expectations, those have to be corrected at a base level. But sometimes it is that resiliency uh, muscle. And so we're having a lot of conversation. We luckily, uh, thankfully, uh, came up with one of our core values being resilience right before this and just was totally accidental and well-timed. So we are beginning, how, how do we build that muscle of resiliency? Resiliency is a muscle. It's not something that we're born with or not. It is a muscle that we can intentionally develop over time. And how can we help uh, folks uh, develop that resiliency over time and support them in that growth, not only because that helps uh, avoid burnout, but also because it is a way for us to invest in the whole person. That resiliency muscle isn't compartmentalized just for personal, uh, just for professional or personal. That is a sort of a life scale that they can take with them uh, whenever their journey at Amplify ends. We had a couple more questions on things that we, again, addressed uh, partly, but maybe not uh, completely enough. Uh, so I want to go back and ask about um, people who distrust the remote work environment and the, the other side of that, which is those who tend to become micromanagers in these environments. So if I could ask you all again to share how you balance that um, as we discussed that lack of control that forces people to kind of you know get right on top and, and try to micromanage um, what what types of, of protocol can we put in place to alleviate some of that so for us has been and, and we're culturally from that uh, mindset where I have to see you to believe to believe you um, because of the, of the experience of, of COVID-19 where it put everybody simultaneously, there wasn't that small, that slow flow into you may be able to do it while you may not be able to manage it. I think that it forced more, um, a, a lot more connectivity between the manager and those teams. Um, and even for those who are big on the micromanagement, element of every little detail, they've had to take a little bit of a step back because it becomes really, really hard to micromanage each and every element of each and every team member. So I think it's strengthening our managers. I think the experience has been relatively healthy in terms of the connectivity, in terms of opening channels of communication, more formally, more purposeful. And Slowly but surely, um, the response that we're getting and the feedback that we're getting is that um, a lot of managers never in their wildest dream believe it could work this well and that they even have some performers who were not as effective on site as they've proven to be remotely, which is an interesting angle. I think what I would add is that there's not everybody is going to be able to change this, right? Sometimes this um, cultural characteristics comes from the top and not everybody can change it. The, the reality is we can't always influence the cultures of the companies in which we work. What we can do as individual contributors, as managers and as culture leaders uh, is over communicate. This is where I am. This is what has my attention. These are my blockers and these are what I'm working on. If we over communicate to our managers, to our direct reports and for you know horizontal build visibility, I think it sets a really important norm and precedent for this is where I am. This is how you communicate about things that are uh, that are you're blocked on and it invites other people to weigh in more strategically and more sustainably on the ways in which your blockers might impact their work. So I think establishing that culture, and that's something nobody has to give you the permission to do, right? You can just start doing it today. It can be an email at the end of the day. It can be a Slack message at the top of the day. There's all sorts of ways that this can look, but anybody can start today over communicating where they're at, what they're working on and what they're blocked on. And that's a great example of where standups can be really valuable. A 15 minute stand up on a daily or every other day basis does wonders for making sure everyone knows what everyone else is working on. 
I had written all the great points that everyone else said, so I have nothing to add to this one. Uh, I do have to get going also. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, do that. And thank you panelists for amazing content. It's been an honor to be with you all today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, we're not done yet. We still, have, um, we still have another couple of questions that we can get to. Um, actually, tying on to what Willie said about over-communicating, there's a question from Susan Stewart who asks, how would you go about reassuring your employees working remotely that they are still productive members of the team and that a lot of it is just getting used to what is being prioritized? So. Uh, I would say communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, talking about the work they are doing, talking actively about here's how what you're working on right now is important. And even if we may not be able to release it or use it immediately, business is going to go on and we will use it. And so it's a value. So just continuing to reinforce that message as, as leaders and managers, I think is incredibly important. And frankly, just checking in with um, especially the people who are often behind the scenes that we don't usually interact with as much or whose work may not be as big and out there and flashy, doing a personal check in like, hey, how you doing? Or, do you have any blockers? Just lets them know they're not forgotten, which gives them, you know, the information that says, oh, that means my work's not forgotten either. So anything you can do to just display that value goes a long way for those employees. I think that give that one of the, the biggest um, benefits that we have in terms of how the current circumstances came about is that we don't have that comparison of the, the remote workforce competing with the attention of the, of the workforce on site. So it's the great equalizer. Everybody's working remotely. So then it's up to the leadership to ensure that everybody has a chance to be in the spotlight. I, Particularly, I, my preference is the morning check-in where everybody's given the opportunity to bring forth what they're doing. It gives them both the visibility. It gives them um, visibility into what the others are doing. Plus, it creates a spotlight and it creates, it conveys the message that what they're doing is important and it's as important as what the next person speaking um, has to say and has to contribute. I think the only thing I would add is, um, regardless of how big or how small somebody's contribution is, giving them a frame for how to think about the shift is really useful. So if some people have become um, really important and strategic to how you're adapting to the crisis, then you can name that. If some people's um, specific function in this moment is not as crucial as other people's, I think it's fine to name that and to give people some context where, you know, after a couple cycles, after we found our footing, things will um, hopefully transition to X. Uh, but in the meantime, this is where our focus is. You should not take it personal. Uh, don't get in your head about the things that are and are not happening right now, but we're transitioning and, you know, we're taking some wartime protocols here. So just letting people know how to think about the silence or the over communication or how things are shifted, I think is useful um, psychological orientation that we can offer as leaders. That was a great answer. All of them actually really, really helpful. Um, I think we have time for one more and um, this is a little bit challenging, but I, I did want to add it in because I think it is important. Uh, while we are in a period of chaos, there are some people who are not going to act in the best interests of the group. And so this person is asking, do you recommend writing up a manager or employee remotely, um, especially if they're using abusive language? So does anybody want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, as someone who leads HR business partner teams and has done so for a long time, I, I think this time it's important for us to balance the world is unusual and there may be some extra grace need, needed during this time. However, there's extra grace needed. <laughs> and so we need everyone to just realize the impact they have on each other. And we are still trying to uh, live a business, you know, so as organizations, we are still trying to deliver. And I think if anything, this is a time where we raise our bar on how we treat each other, not allow for a lower bar. And so, you know, do you write them up? It depends on what your company policy is, what your normal practices are. But if you were in person, in office, would it be okay? 
And if it's not, and you would normally address it, I think you still address it. You're just in a new, you're in a new location. You're not in a new set of expectations for how you treat each other. We've been very firm and into in that in terms of the transition of, of your laptop does not create a new set of rules. Um, just because the, the behavior and your performance still are expected to be contributing to the best interest of the organization. So any behavior or any level of performance that is under par or is just inappropriate will be addressed. I think it's such an important conversation and such an important question. Uh, one of the phenomena that we see when we're communicating in ways that are mediated by electronics is some of our uh, lesser habits come to bear. It's really easy to get angry and for that, that, to that to be communicated in that way. So one of the things that I would, I would offer is more coaching is helpful, more feedback is helpful. So it's not just about being punitive. It's not just about um, coming down in the ways that we would if we were in the office place, but also understanding like what is the best way of communicating certain things to certain people. So for example, if you have something that is emotionally loaded or challenging, pick up the phone, get on video. Don't, do, don't try and do that over text or over email or over Slack. Um, go as high bandwidth as possible if it's a challenging conversation. That alone can mitigate a lot of the issues that tend to escalate where people are missing each other, talking past each other. Um, leaders might want to uh, embrace emojis for the first time. You know, there's a generational impact here and, and different people in different industries are going to have uh, different ways of orienting towards this, but over communicating the intention behind your messaging, be that an emoji, be that a smiley face, be that a thumbs up, those things really go a long way because we haven't talked a lot about the generational component here, but the younger folks coming into the workplace that are used to communicating in ways that are mediated by electronics uh, are going to have different ways of orienting as compared to people who are very senior in their career, their executives, etc., who view emojis as completely unprofessional. So I think having a conversation about communication norms in addition to everything that Kate mentioned is really, really vital. Extremely helpful. Thank you for those those answers. Um, I want to do a lightning round on this last question because I think it's kind of fun. Uh, do you have creative suggestions for how to make morning check-ins more exciting than a roll call, but not so long that they eat into the workday? So let's just do 30 seconds apiece. Lydia, you begin. So I, I'm still debating on the pajama thing, so I don't know. I, I'm struggling with that one. Uh, but I think I'm going to challenge my team um, for the best meme for the day. Um, they're starting to get really creative and they can just send them in and we'll just share them. And I think it'll, it'll warm us up for the morning and it, it goes with the culture of the group. For me, I, uh, I always encourage the team to try and I, I come up with a fun question. So one of my favorites is, what have you learned about yourself during quarantine that you may not have before? Uh, and that always evokes some pretty fun answers. Uh, I don't know how much I can add here besides just watch. I'm not going to make a specific recommendation, but I will say that my memes and my orientations and my inside jokes have all been dominated by the Tiger King phenomenon. So if you haven't watched it uh, and you're not talking about it, you're missing out. My diversity, equity, inclusion, best practice, watch Tiger King and talk to me about it specifically. Yeah, that is certainly becoming a cultural phenomenon. And there are millions of memes that have been generated by that cast of characters. The truth is indeed stranger than fiction. Um, Arrest them all. Arrest them all. <laughs> so with these last couple of minutes, um, I'm going to say thank you so much to the group and to Steve and from day one and our sponsors. And I'm going to turn it back over to Steve with a little bit of housekeeping. Sure. Well, thank you, Lydia, and thank you all speakers. Uh, that was fascinating, fun, insightful, um, a great conversation all around. So um, thanks also to our sponsors, Amplify and Lumaps, and everybody here who participated and watched and sent questions in. If you'd like to join us for more virtual events, you can head to our web website, which is fromday1.co, and check out more of our upcoming webinars. Also, um, there will be the full video of this that you could share and also a, um, a story about it with all the highlights. So thanks again from, from day one and thank you all speakers, you're great.